Imagine if you would, you're walking in a field where there are a lot of landmines and you don't know where they're buried and you got to walk through this field. That's a very dangerous journey, such as getting into the book of Daniel if you don't know how to navigate your way to the minefield. I'm going to show you how to do that this morning. A lot of people get the book of Daniel, especially when they get to chapter 7 on the chapter 12, what happened, where we're going, what's going on, and I'm going to help you to navigate through there. You got to see this from a couple of different viewpoints, and one from Daniel and other one from God. Imagine if you're a 17 year old boy, teenage boy, you got taken into captivity, far away from home, and you're having to learn a new language, new culture, and have a whole different kind of experience than what you were used to. And you're there for 70 years. And during these 70 years, what are you thinking about concerning your home, your people, your land, the promises God had given to you? And Daniel finds himself having gone through some traumatic experiences in the lion's den, he's seen his friends get thrown in the fiery furnace. And he's beginning to wonder, God, you know, what about Israel? What about Judah? Didn't you promise David that you were going to do certain things and fulfill the covenant and give him land and bring a Messiah from his lineage? Didn't you promise that you were going to do all these things? So Daniel's sitting there in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, Cyrus, going from the Babylonians to the media Persians. And he's wondering, God, what in the world is going on? Okay. If you're any kind of a Bible student and you're reading through the book of Daniel, you will begin to notice, hey, things don't seem to be in order. Okay? You read in the last chapter where uh, Darius is slain, killed, because he did a foolish thing by committing idolatry and um, blasphemy by taking the items that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had brought from Jerusalem and put them into the temples of their God. And he began, some of them were goblets, and he poured wine in, he began to drink with them to show off to all his friends, and God sent a, a finger to write on the wall and told them, hey, you know what? Your Belshazzar, your time is over. He died that night. Well, in the next chapter, you see him alive again. So, if you're going to notice things like this. So I want to explain it to you. Chronologically, if you see up here on my board, and I'm going to go through this, and, 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 and I'm going to explain it. It's going to be so simple. If you want to take notes, you can take a picture of the whiteboard with your iPhone or whatever. Uh, take a snapshot of it. You're going to have it. Chronologically, this is how the chapters go. Chapters one, two, three, four, then seven, eight, five, then nine, six, ten, and eleven. Okay? That's the chronological order of the book of Daniel. Well, why didn't they put them in that order? Let me explain it to you. It's the book of Daniel is written in two different languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. And God wants to give a message to both the Gentiles and to the nation of Israel. Okay? And he's doing it in a prophetic way. So he's got to show this prophecy, much of which was, uh, was not fulfilled in Daniel's time, but has been fulfilled in our time. He has to do it in such a way that he demonstrates his sovereignty over all the nations. And that he's going to bring a conclusion of all the nations 
with the messianic rule with the Lord Jesus Christ comes in reign and every government entity and country is going to be utterly destroyed. Okay. In chapter 1, we have an introduction. Okay, and it's written in Hebrew. By the time you get to chapter 2, 3 and 4, it's written in Aramaic. 7 and 8 is written in Hebrew. 5 is written in Aramaic. Chapter 9 is written in Hebrew. Chapter 6 is written in Aramaic. And chapters 10 and 11 in Hebrew. So, the, and you're putting this, this book together for the Bible, which is the canon, they decide to do it a little differently. And that's why in your Bible it's different. Instead of putting it in its chronological order, they decided to put it in its logical order. And the logical order is this. Chapters 1 to 6 is primarily historical. And chapters 7 to 12 is primarily prophetical. It's a little overlapping in that, but that's the way you could even break it down to this, chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 4, which is an introduction, and it sets the stage for the Hebrew boys being taken into Babylon and the captivity and how they found favor and all that. And that's written in Hebrew. Chapter 2, 4 to 7, 28, is written primarily to the Gentiles, and so that's in Aramaic, which was the common language of that day. Okay? And then chapter 8 to 12 is primarily written in Hebrew. Okay, now, besides that, you're going to notice, as a Bible student, an amazing similarity between chapter 2 and chapter 7. They seem almost the same, okay? There's a difference, though. In chapter 2, you have Nebuchadnezzar... <coughs> He has this dream of this big statue, which is made up of different metallic uh, material. He sees the head as being gold, the chest and arms of silver, the waist in bronze, the legs and iron, and then the feet, the toes, and iron and clay. Okay? He's seeing it from man's perspective. When we look at governments, when we look at dynasties, we see them primarily as powerful nations. If you notice, the Babylonians were a tremendous nation, and, and God told Nebuchadnezzar, you know, you can do anything you want. People feel safe under you so long as I, you acknowledge me. You know, when he didn't, he went, and he went insane for seven years. Okay, eating grass just like a cow or a mule or a donkey. Uh, uh, but when you, he acknowledged him, man, everybody was prosperous and they were doing pretty good under him. Okay. Then you had the media Persians. Okay, they came next. Then you have the Greeks, then Rome, and eventually you're going to have the Roman, revived Roman Empire. From man's perspective, look at the value in gold, in silver, in bronze, and iron, which is strong. You see it as being something very courageous, very noble, very powerful, very patriotic. What man can do, okay? You're seeing it from a human point of view. All these dynasties. Not from God's vantage point. God doesn't see Nebuchadnezzar as such. And as we get into it, and we get into chapter 7, I'm going to give it more detail. He sees them as beasts. Okay, you ever wonder what America looks like to God? During World War I, World War II, during the Civil War, during the Revolution... Have you ever wondered what it looked like to Japanese people when um, they dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki? You know, and, and uh, what Hitler did to Jewish people and to people that were deformed or mentally ill. You ever seen uh, in Cambodia 
what they did to all those uh, poor peasants and all that, uh, uh, the Khmer Raj, and, and what the atrocities that they commit, China, what they do, Cuba, different communist countries, what Russia has done, what they continue to do with Iran. You know, uh, all these countries have something in common. They always take over another country by means of tremendous violence, beastly. Okay, when Americans came, what did they do to the Indians? They mass here, almost committed genocide with so many of the tribes. Okay, so God doesn't see this as a noble accomplishment. He sees it as a beastly accomplishment. And so he identifies these dynasties, you know, like Babylon and Greek and Rome, and they revive Roman Empire as beastly. With that, he with Babylon is a lion, Media Persian as a bear, the Greek as a leopard, Rome as a beast, and the final revived Roman Empire as a monster. Six six six. From man's perspective, it all looks pretty powerful. You think of Alexander the Great, speedily conquered all the world, and then sat down and died at the age of 33 because he had no more worlds to conquer. And then after he, in a drunken rage, he killed his best friend. Okay, beastly. You think of Napoleon, you think of Putin today, you think of our government today and the beastly things that they are doing throughout our country. There's nothing noble about this. Let me make a little contrast here. Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. There's similarities and there's also similarities when we get, as we've shown in the book of Revelation. It's describing the same events, but from a different vantage point. Okay, from man's vantage point, and then you're also seeing it from God's vantage point. So if you're studying history and they're trying to make it seem very patriotic and all that, as far as man is concerned, yes. As far as God is concerned, no. Okay? And then it's been the history since the beginning of time. You've seen Cain. He slain his own brother, Abel. Then you saw a time when people were killing each other and God had to come in and establish a death penalty. Then you saw with Israel and Israel tried to uh, was given as a nation, and but yet they didn't want to follow God in a, under a theocratic rule. They demanded a king, and so you see these kings now, they're going and they're trying to conquer and doing different things. It's been that way all through history. Okay, all through history. Even now, you know, there's a documentary on now where they talk about assassins. And um, uh, United States, by definition, it doesn't allow assassins, at least not outright, where you go and shoot another uh, leader. But they do it through drones. You have uh, unmanned drones going in them, but they don't call that an assassin. They call it killing terrorists. It's the same thing. Okay, uh, Russia does it all the time. Uh, they use plutonium, or they use cyanide, or they use. Uh, they got all kind of interesting ways of of killing their opponent. I think recently they killed uh, one of the generals that was opposed to Putin's uh, plans there in Ukraine. That goes on all the time. Uh, Kennedy was assassinated. There's a lot of history behind that that isn't all being revealed as to why Kennedy was uh, assassinated because he let down the Cuban uh, exiles and going back into uh, Cuba, there was, he was supposed to support him, and then at the last minute, he did not. He betrayed him. So, uh, excuse me, that's my phone. I thought I turned it off. Okay, I do that every now and then. I'm fallible. <laughs> okay, so we see that man has this image of murder, of killing, of conquering. If you even look at all the noble people, 
that they have awarded uh, high medals to and all that. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Look what happened to General Patton, Adi Murphy. You know, even the recent guy that uh, they, they made a movie on about a sniper, he was killed by a former veteran too, you know. That which you trust in generally will take your life as a principle. Let us to trust in the Lord. God is sovereign. He has no respect. And he says it over and over in his, in his, in his word, on the strength of a man, on the legs of a horse, where he values man as man who puts his trust in him. In his sovereign care. In his, so Daniel's sitting there in Babylon. He's wondering about all these things. Okay? So, again, contrast. Daniel, too, is given to Neb Nebuchadnezzar, a Gentile king. Daniel 7 is given to Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is an unbeliever. Daniel is a believer. This is from an earth perspective over here. This is going to be from a heaven perspective in chapter 7. Here we see history from a human perspective. And here in chapter 7, we see history from a divine, heavenly perspective. In chapter 2, Daniel does the interpretation. In chapter 7, an angel does the interpretation. In the first uh, six chapters, Daniel always talks about himself in the third person. From 7 to 12, he's talking about himself in the first person. Here you have the dynasties in a metallic form as being described as gold, silver, bronze, iron, and a mixture of clay and iron. And here you see them described in a beastly form. Devastating, ferocious, lusting for blood. You see most movies today that are real popular, they have to do with vengeance, or they have to do with crime, or they have to do with the mafia, or they have to do with some kind of war, or some kind of murder, or something. I see some of these people are so caught up in watching these type of shows that that's because they glorify themselves in looking at things like that. They think there's something noble about that. And as far as God is concerned, it's not. Okay? Why did God do this? Okay, because, and it's really simple, he's trying to communicate a message that no matter what king is in charge, no matter what government entity is in power, God is sovereign. He has the final say in everything. He allows evil in order to purify that which is good. Okay, you see things happening in our country today, there's a reason for that, because we pretty much booted God out of, the, out of the picture in terms of his word, in terms of prayer, in terms of his uh, sense of morality. And so what do you have? You have a country now that has dove deep into paganism, deep into atheism, deep into pantheism, deep into polytheism. A lot of mixed worldviews with a lot of different ideologies that is devoid of a sovereign God who is holy. The message of Daniel should be encouraging because he's letting Daniel know, you know what, all this is going to end. I'm going to come back and I'm going to utterly destroy all it is. I'm going to set up my millennial kingdom. And then I have created the heaven and earth for all those who put their trust in me. So they can spend eternity with me to experience the things that I has not seen. Mine has not thought of all the wonderful things that God has in store for us. This book should give us encouragement and light of all all the travesties and disgusting things that are taking place in this world today.
stay with me. We're going to make it through this book. If you found this helpful, share it with others. God bless you. You all have a great day.